So uh, every once in a while, I like to tell these personal stories from uh, adventures, because to to me, stories probably the most important thing I I have. Uh, definitely the most valuable thing I own are my stories and memories. One because I don't very, have very much money, <laughs> and uh, two they just have enriched my life um, beyond anything beyond anything I could ever imagine. Um, and you you learn so much when you go through something yourself. It's one thing to learn a story, you know, learn from someone else's, but man, going through it yourself. You, you learn it in a totally new way, you know, you can, you know, people can tell you what it's like to have kids, or what it's like to, you know, raise a family, or, or to, I don't know, get in a car accident, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you really just have to go through to understand, no matter how much you read about it or listen to it, so I encourage you, make stories with your life, and I, this one's one of my favorites, um, I, I was doing a few bike trips, and you know, I know y'all hear a lot about my bike trips. That's about all I did was ride my bike long distances, and uh, it was one story, man. It was uh, I did the Tour Divide, um, which is the bike race. It's mountain bike race, Canada to Mexico, but I wanted to d- do a big loop through all the national parks out west. So after that race, I, I turned around. I, I Jumped right back on the bike, hit the Mexican border, turned around, said goodbye to my best friend Paul, and who 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 did the tour divide with me. Then I headed towards the west coast, then kind of back and forth from the coast in the to the mountains, hitting the uh, Sierra Nevada national parks and all the parks along the way. So it was like thirty something national parks in five months. It was awesome, just the most incredible scenery and trip and diversity you could ever imagine it started in banff uh alberta canada and then followed the rocky mountains down to the mexican border and then hit all the national parks going west grand canyon petrified forest joshua tree all that and then headed north um through the sierras like i said then the cascades and the coast of uh oregon and washington and crater lake mount rainier olympic all that and then straight east uh on the northern portion of america uh which was like north cascades um all those parks it was awesome just awesome and then dropped back down into the rocky mountains rocky mountain national park great sand dunes Gunnison, all that, and then all the parks in Utah, all five parks in Utah, which was Zion, Bryce, Capitol Reef, uh, Arches and Moat, or Arches and Canyonlands, and then finished the trip in Yosemite, where I ended up living and working for the next six months. Got married um, after I left there in Vegas, and then came straight to uh, to Denver. And we've been here ever since. Anyway, that was the trip. Um, on that trip, as I was making my way towards the West Coast, I had to go through uh, Death Valley. And I had been on the road about two and a half months at this point, and I timed it just right. I hit Death Valley, which if you've ever been there, it's it's at the lowest point, it's 282 feet below sea level. It's, it's crazy. It, there's a sign above you at that point called Badwater Basin. There's a sign on a cliff that says this is like sea level. And it is so high above your head. And so, um, you know, some of the hottest places in the world are lower elevation. And this place is the hottest place in the world. It has the highest recorded temperature uh, surface level ever, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, you know, obviously a volcano is hotter than that. But, you know, the the hottest environment that's heated by the sun. Um, and this day was... No different. It was the last weekend of July, which was really, honestly, looking back, really stupid and foolish of me to try to bike through there uh, at that time. But, you know, I didn't know any better. So I, I had seen everywhere I'd wanted to go. You know, I'd just come from the Grand Canyon, just spent a couple days in Vegas, a while in Vegas, because my dad and stepmom flew in and I spent some time with them. Then headed out and I had a. It was so hot that I I took a sheet from the hotel room and cut it up and and used it as a mask and a cover over my head and my shoulders 
and uh, my body really I looked like a ghost on a bicycle because I'm pretty fair skin I'm a ginger redhead so I, I burn pretty easy um, and the hottest place in the world on the hottest weekend of the year was not ideal for me and uh, when you're coming from Vegas which is only like a couple thousand feet elevation you drop pretty quickly down into Death Valley so it's you go through this little town called Prump and then you just I was coasting like half the day just flying down these mountains and I thought man this is awesome but as I got lower you know the, it, it, the air got hotter and hotter and hotter and I'm, I'm going pretty quick but man it, it, it felt like a hair dryer in your face the air was just so hot and dry I almost couldn't breathe the, the air was coming at my face so fast that and it was so warm it was hard to breathe in it even just coasting downhill so I get to the bottom this place called Furnace Creek and it's uh, getting close to evening and so I'm like I, I stop at this place called Zabriskie Point uh, to take a picture and I was like oh my god this is this is unbearably hot and I started to get just a little bit worried that I wasn't going to be able to to bike out of there because when you leave Death Valley there's two passes you got to get over. You go down, you go below sea level, and then you got to climb. I think in nine miles, might be might be eighteen miles. I think nine is the halfway point. So yeah, eighteen miles. You got to climb from below sea level to five thousand feet over a pass, and then you drop back down to below sea level, and then you got to climb four thousand feet to get out. And all this is in about you know a hundred miles from one side of the park to the other and like I said it it was so hot it was unbelievable they had signs out temporary signs out on the side of the road that said don't park in the road because it'll melt your tires the asphalt was so hot if you stopped moving on it it could melt your shoes it could melt your tires and I and I had uh, some bottle water bottles on the bottom of my bike kind of underneath the bike and they were getting so hot, and they were plastic, that they were starting to melt through the metal bottle cages. They were uh, uh, like sagging through the metal of the bottle cages, which were, I think, aluminum. But those were getting so hot, it was leaving indentions, deep, deep indentions in the uh, in the water bottles. And the water inside was, uh, it was terrible to drink. It was so hot, it was like drinking water I was getting them ready to make tea for or something. But... uh Drop down into Furnace Creek, and I'm I'm starting to get a little worried. I'm like, this is this is ridiculously hot. And I thought, well, I'm gonna get up early in the morning and try to get out of here because I've got two big big passes to go over. But I didn't know that. I didn't do any research on my route. I never. I mean, I just that was pretty stupid back then, uh, which wasn't all that long ago. So you know, I still have a lot of that to deal with today. But <laughs> it was. Uh, I can't say it enough. It was just hot as hot as hell. So I get in this Furnace Creek. There's a the general store, and I'm sitting on the porch and just kind of taking it easy the rest of the day because even even descending down in there was a, a lot of work uh, because of how hot it was getting. And in, in that day, it was 125 degrees the day I was there, which for all our uh, international listeners, that's about 52 degrees Celsius, which is it's ungodly hot, 51 and a half, but I'm sitting there on the porch uh, under this awning, and, and someone comes up to me and says, like, what the heck are you doing? Because my bike looks ridiculous. It's a modified mountain bike with panniers on the side, saddle bags, a frame bag, and I've got a big old uh, front bag, and uh, I've got a small little hydration pack on. I, I look ridiculous because I love color. So I wear I wear the most obnoxious colored shirt. The bike is bright red. All my bags are different colors because I, I just love color. It doesn't coordinate at all. It's just colorful. So I look like a dadgum rainbow out there, especially with my red beard. I mean, my beard is red. If you've ever seen pictures, it's it's pretty it's pretty red. But this guy comes up to me. He's like, "Hey, man." Like, what the heck are you doing? I tell him a little bit about it, and he goes, let me buy you a beer. So I'm like, all right, yeah, that sounds good. I drink a beer, and he buys me another one. 
and I have another one. And I don't think I've ever told this part of the story to uh, to my mom, so sorry, Mom. Um, so I drink a couple more. This guy just kept buying me beers, which is, you know, that's not uncommon out there. You're, doing, you're running across America. You're biking across America. People want to buy you, you know, a Gatorade, a drink, uh, um, you know, a dinner even. I mean, it happened pretty regularly, especially if you're doing your trip for a cause. And at the time, I was. Um, and so I, I had a couple beers in me. I was probably pretty dehydrated just despite trying to drink so much water. And I'm, I'm at the point, I, I get pretty quickly, I get to the point where I'm like, I, I'm not going to bike anymore. And so I, I decide to kind of go behind uh, the, the general store and there's this little area, to, like picnic area, it's fenced in. And I get some pizza from the store, which was, you know, God, it was a terrible decision. It was 100 and stinking 25 degrees. I'm eating pizza. I'm getting, you know, having a little too much to drink. I'm completely dehydrated. And night comes, and I, I just lay out. It's so hot, I don't even take out my sleeping bag. I lay out my sleeping pad. I take off my shirt down to my down to my bike shorts. I'm, that's all I'm wearing. No socks, no nothing. And it does not get below 105 degrees all through the night. And I am sitting there sweating all over my pad, which was a climate pad. Um, best pads out there. Anyway, and I'm sitting there, the box of pizza is next to my side, half open. The, almost all the pizza's gone. I've got an empty beer bottle next to me, and I'm laying straight on the ground in this picnic area. And there's nobody out there. Nobody's bothering me. No one goes to Death Valley on the hottest weekend of the year. And I wake up that night. I'm like, something is something is on 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 me. Something is touching me, my legs, my arms. And I wake up. And there's a coyote next, right next to my body pulling my pizza out of the box. And I'm kind of delirious. I'm so hot. I'm still a little hungover. Or I am hungover. And this thing is... <laughs> it takes me a second to realize what was going on and, and what, what it was. But it was a coyote pulling a pizza right out of my box that was right under my arm next to me. Freaks me out a little bit. I wake up. I'm a little startled. It's about two in the morning. It's hot as my pad is soaking wet with sweat, and I'm like, I th this is this is going to be the worst day tomorrow. I meant to get up then and just start pedaling out of there, but it didn't happen. I mean, I I I, I fell back asleep. Uh, like I said, I had a little too much to drink, and I fell right back asleep. I woke up. I don't know, about half an hour before the sun was coming up, by 5.30, 6 o'clock, whatever it was, and uh, I was like, all right, I got to get going. So I put my clothes back on, get my bike ready, and it is just freaking, God, it is so miserably hot. And I jump on the bike, and I watch the most beautiful sunrise over the desert. If you've ever been to Death Valley, you know it's a, it's a complete desert, but there are huge mountains surrounding it. Just, you, you know, imagine... The beautiful snow-capped Rockies or the Sierras or the Alps, but that just look like a desert. It's all brown. Hardly any plants. It's just different shades of brown all the way to the top. Might be a little snow on top. At that time of the year, there was nothing. It was just brown. It was a very bizarre place. So I bike around, uh, and I start climbing up this, uh, climbing up this pass. And there was another little general store, I think it's called Stovepipe Wells or something, right towards, right before you start climbing up the first, uh, first like 18 mile pass. And again, this is below sea level and you're getting ready to go up to 5,000 feet. It's a mile climb um, pretty quickly and it's pretty, you know, it winds quite a bit, but it's, it's straight for like the first nine miles. It's just straight up this mountain. God, I, it just makes me sick just thinking about it. Ugh. Well, anyway, that little general store, I stopped and, and, and got a little Gatorade. I'm like, I'm going to need something a little extra than just the water I've been drinking. And uh, there was this the cyclist there. He, he was from France. He was about my age, and he, was, he just said he was taking a, taking a break. He looked pretty hot, and I um, didn't think much of it. So I start going up the pass, and I time it so stupidly. I timed it right after noon, and, you know, that is just... Uh, 
hottest part of the day. That stretch in the afternoon is just so, so hot. And this day was also about 124 degrees, so about 51 degrees Celsius. And I start going up the pass, and people people are yelling out their window. Like, some other people stop to say, you should not be doing this. And I was like, what the heck is the big deal? It's just a hot day. But admittedly, I had not had the I had not taken the best care of myself the night before. <laughs> I wasn't feeling great. But as I got going up this mountain, um, there, there was a rest stop about halfway up the pass, nine miles up. And I'm like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll get there and take a little break and keep going. And those little mile markers up the pass that said, you know, mile one, two, three, all the way to nine. And I saw mile two and mile three. And I'm like, this is taking longer than I expected, like a lot longer. And this is a lot harder than I was accounting for. And I am drinking a lot more water than I thought I was going to. And there's very few cars. Um, you know, I mean, there are people still travel through there in the summer, but a lot of people will avoid it. It can overheat your vehicle in, in a matter of minutes. And signs that were still everywhere that there's not a whole lot of pull-offs and you're not supposed to pull off on the side of the road or all in the road because, it, like I said, it could literally melt your tires. I have rubber, like big rubber uh, handlebars on my bike for, for touring kind of just to sit my arms on. And those started melting. They were getting stuck to my gloves. So I'd pull my hands off the, the, the rubber handles and pieces of the rubber would be stuck to my glove and it'd be tacky like like melted cheese and started pulling off and getting real gummy in my water bottles that day was I, I hadn't been there in the heat of the day yet that low in elevation and today was or that day was just un, unbearable my water was almost too hot to drink in the bottles on the bike and uh I was starting to panic just a little bit because I thought, you know, I was about halfway up the pass, four and a half miles, and I, I said, I don't, I don't know if I can make this. I, my heart's racing. I'm, I'm getting pretty dizzy, and someone stopped and gave me cold water, and uh, I used it to, to cool my head down a little bit um, before drinking it, and that, that helped tremendously. But I'm going, and I'm hitting mile six, mile seven, and I'm like, I got two more miles to go, and I, I, I can't, I can't do this. I'm about to, I'm, I'm about to f- pass out. And at at this bathroom pull off thing, there was, it's like a little rest stop. There's a men and women's women's bathroom. There's an abandoned building on one side, looks like an old visitor center or something. There's a little gazebo, a couple picnic tables, and a water spigot. Finally, I get there. I, I come uh, just limping into there, essentially, on the bike. I, I lay the bike down, and I turn on the spigot and put my head under it, and the water almost burns my head. It's so hot coming out of the ground. And I go over underneath this abandoned uh, building, the visitor center or whatever it was. There's a little porch on it, and the porch is covered. And the shade was a relief, but not much of one. And so I decided to cook a little food, and I drank as much water as I could. And I just passed out. I had a terrible headache, which is a sign of dehydration. I don't know how long I'm out for. And all of a sudden, someone's crouched over me, and they're shaking my shoulders with a little bit of uh, uh, concern in their voice. And I open my eyes and I freak out just a hair because, you know, I got just woken out of a, a sleep. And it was a park service ranger. And he's like, hey, man, hey, you okay? You okay? And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're like, what, what's going on? What's going on? He just, we were both very startled, it seemed like, even though he was the one waking me up. And he's like, man, I, you know, I was just making sure nothing, you, you know, you were okay. You weren't, you know, unconscious or something. I was like, I was just taking a nap. What, what's wrong? Because I could just tell he was, you know, something was up. He goes, are you traveling by yourself? And I was like, yeah, yeah, why? He goes, man. He's like, there's another guy who's who's doing, a, you know, he's on a bike. He, he, he's got all his stuff, his touring equipment or whatever, just like your bike. And uh, he's about halfway down this pass, about four and a half miles, and we found him on the road. Um, he was dead. 
And they were like, you know, we looked at his IDs, this French guy. And I'm like, oh my God, that was the guy that I just passed down at the bottom at that general store. They said, yeah, he must have been biking up this pass like you were. And he had a heat stroke and just we found him on the asphalt. And the, 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 the horrible thing is, you know, if you fall off a motorcycle or fall into the road in Death Valley on a hot day, you know, your your skin on that asphalt is not... It's not a pretty scene when people show up. I'll just put it that way. But this guy had apparently just died right there, and and the the ranger was coming to check on me to make sure I wasn't with him or we were friends or or traveling together or something. And, uh, man, it really freaked me out because I thought that could have easily been me. I mean, this guy was my age, probably in better shape than me. He'd been biking for, like, a few years around the world or something. Uh, and he's like, dude, I've, and the ranger said, I've never seen bike tours out here in July. And I don't think it's wise for you to be out here. And I'll be honest. I was about, you know, two and a half months into the trip. I was a little bit, I was burned out in a couple ways. And, you know, I'm not the most resilient person naturally. So <laughs> any, any real difficulties, I definitely consider, um, moving on from a project or, or something like this. And the ranger was like, Hey man, like we can we cannot have you in danger. If you at all feel like you can't do this or you need to go somewhere, please let me know. And I will, I'll take you anywhere you need to go. And I, I didn't want to get rides and I didn't want to, you know, quit the trip. But that day I was just really feeling it. Like, man, I had just left Vegas stayed in a hotel room a few nights and, and ate all the food I wanted. And, you know, the buffets in Vegas are super cheap. So it was, it was quite a relief to be there, um, to get out of the hot, hot sun. But I sat there a minute and I told the ranger, you know, I needed to think about it, you know, cause he's like, I'm at the, he goes, all you got to do is turn around, ride to the bottom of this pass and I'll, I'll take you anywhere you need to go. I'm, I, I live close to Vegas. I'll take you there tonight. And, uh, it was sounding pretty tempting. Honestly, I was missing my hometown back in Florida. It sound, you know, it, it, I don't know what I, I, I'm usually not like that, but I, I think I was just so delirious from the heat that this offer sounded really tempting to, to basically quit the trip or at least postpone it for a while. But I'll be honest, if I would have went down the hill at that point, I, I probably wouldn't have come back up. I was, I was not in the best mental state at that point. And funds were getting tight, and I know that this was probably in in my schedule was changing, so I know this was probably my only chance to finish this trip. And and, uh, I had never seen Yosemite National Park at that point, and and, and that was one of my next locations. I was going to make it through Death Valley, um, then go under the Sierras to Sequoia, Kings Canyon, then Yosemite. um, Well, Joshua Tree first, and kind of loop up, so... My most, you know, anticipated park was going to be Yosemite, and, you know, I just knew that was a place that was going to be important to me for the rest of my life, but I hadn't seen it yet, so I didn't know what I was missing, you know? So I sit there under that little uh, awning under that porch of that building. The park ranger gave me his cell phone number, no, gave me his cell phone number, and I thought, well, that's useless out here. There's no service anyway, <laughs> but he's like, if you just bike down this hill, And uh, we'll get you where you need to go. So I sit there for a little while contemplating it. Probably an hour. I'm like, oh, God, should I do this? Should I not? I'm really miserable. I could die. I could literally die out here, which didn't sound too appealing. And I decided I'm going to quit. I was out of it. I was totally out of it. Looking back, I was like stumbling around. I I mean, he probably should have just taken me. But I didn't see all that at the time. And so... I get on the bike. I said, I, I, I'm done. I'm done with this. You know, forget this trip. I said a ton of expletives. I just yelled them out into the desert. Wasn't anybody around. And I said, I'm done with this crap. <laughs> so I start going down the hill. I, I, I go, I go 20, 30 feet. I'm just getting some momentum to take my foot off the ground so I can, uh, so I can pedal with both feet when coming up over the hill, coming up over the pass that I'm getting ready to go down, I see a cowboy hat. And then I see a face. And then coming up more, there's this shirtless guy covered in tattoos wearing sandals 
on a bike. And I'm like, what the heck? Who, what is this person doing? And so I just stop and wait for him. He was only, you know, maybe a hundred yards down the road. And I'm like, who are you? He goes, hi, my name is, my name is Caden. I'm, uh, I'm biking around the world. And I'm, I'm from South Africa. And I, and I won't, I won't attempt a South African accent here, but essentially he was riding from Argentina up to Alaska. He'd been across Africa. He's ridden across um, Europe and Asia. I mean, he had been all over the world. It was unbelievable. And I was like, holy cow, I got to at least stop and talk to this guy for a little while. So I turned around, you know, and essentially walked back to that national park building and we sit down at a picnic table together. I was like, dude, tell, tell me about where you're going and what you're doing. And we sit there and talk and he's got, God, he's got stories. Holy cow. He has story after story after story about fighting people with machetes to save his bike, to climbing mountains all through Argentina and Chile as he made his way up the Pan American Highway. I mean, it was just, he was an epic person, super thick accent, covered in these amazing tattoos, big old cowboy hat. And I mean, he just looked like pure adventure. And we get to talking and he's like, hey man, you know, you, you, you don't seem like you're doing okay. What's going on? And I told him, I was like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, I don't want to do this trip. And he says, oh man. He's like, you can't quit. You can't quit, man. He goes, this is what life is about. He goes, I I tell you what, I'm going to camp with you tonight to ensure that you can't quit. I'm going to sleep right next to you and make sure that we do this together. I was like, all right. I mean, that sounds good. But in my mind, I'd already made up. I'm like, I'm done with this crap. I'm leaving this trip. I'm done. I'm ready to go home. Take a break. And so that night, I had a stopwatch out, and I set it for 1 a.m. I was like, I'm going to leave in the middle of the night when it's, you know, the coolest, and I'm going to ride four and a half miles or nine miles down to the bottom of this hill, and I'm going to wait at that ranger station until the morning, and I'm leaving. And so we both go to sleep, and we, we lay on the picnic tables to avoid, you know, scorpions and snakes. So we're just laying on top of these picnic tables right next to each other after a great evening of just hanging out and talking and uh I didn't tell Kate in this. I, I felt pretty terrible and this was this was not like me. So I know that I was totally delirious because I would never have just lied to his face like that. And, and so one AM came around and I and I got a uh my my, my watch went off. You know and it woke Caden up too. And he's like, Hey where you what, what are you doing? I was like, I'm I'm just gonna get an early start. And uh, little did he know, I was just going to ride down the hill <laughs> and never see him again. <laughs> but what ended up happening is I start packing up, and I hear this really strange sound. And it, it was like all around me. I was like, what the heck is that noise? And I'm out in the open still, and then I felt something hit me on my on my shoulder. And it was rain. And then it just started to pour. I mean, it, within minutes, both Caden and I had grabbed everything off these tables and taken them under the gazebo. It started to straight up pour rain. And I was thinking to myself, if there was ever a time to get out of the play, the hottest place in the world on the hottest weekend, right when I want to quit all this whole trip, this epic trip that I've been planning for a year that I saved up, that I worked my butt off in college for, that I worked two extra jobs till midnight every night to save up for this, this would be the perfect time to leave this valley when it's raining in the middle of the night. Because I, you know, I was, I was really actually scared of having a heat stroke. And so I, I put my bike pretty much perpendicular to the road. And I said, all right, left or right is quitting. And left is continuing on and seeing what this trip has to offer. So I turned left and I started biking the next nine miles up the hill. And I I got over the pass. And as I was going down, um, the rain had cleared and the, the moon was out. And it was, I could see everything. I could see this whole desert. I could see from 5,000 feet past down back down to sea level. It was absolutely epic. It was epic beyond. It was it, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. 
I go past the next pass and and it's sunrise and I stop at this little restaurant and get breakfast. It's like all you can eat something, hash browns or something. And I get out of the valley and I sit there and wait to see if uh, Caden would make his way out. And he did. He, he, I waited for him and uh, he was going farther north and I was going to go south around the Sierras. So we both said goodbye to each other and I told him thank you. And I continued on from there. And I got through to the very eastern side of the Sierras on a highway called 395. And if you've ever seen that view, it's it's absolutely amazing. You get to basically sit right under Mount Whitney um, and the whole the whole Sierra divide. And it is it is absolutely incredible. And I'd have to say the most incredible moments from that trip came after that experience. Um, I ended up going through Yosemite. I spent a week there. I fell in love with it. Fell in love with it so much that after the trip, I decided to bike back to Yosemite and live there for six months and work. It's the most, it's my favorite place in the whole world now. And I think, you know, what what, what would have happened if I wouldn't have continued and I would have quit that day? I would have probably never seen Yosemite in that way. I I mean, I'm, I'm sure I would have gone eventually, but it wasn't, wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have had to work for it like that. I wouldn't have appreciated it like that. And God, it was, I I shudder to think of what would have happened if I would have quit that day when everything seemed against me. You know, this guy my age had just died. And the two moments I wanted to quit, here comes some dude biking around the world just in time to catch me before I started bombing down this pass and to inspire me and basically force me to keep going. And then I was going to quit anyway. And then what happened? It started raining. It started raining right when I was going to leave. It ended up raining so much that night that the roads, some of the roads got washed out. And you know, that's a big problem out there. And uh, so much so that the bottom of the pass was completely washed out. So if we wouldn't have made it up there that day, there's a good chance I couldn't have gone anyway. It was just, just felt like a larger than life moment. And uh, the most incredible things, most incredible times came after that. And those events led me to eventually reconnecting with the woman that became my wife. Um, our, our relationship blossomed that, that, that era when I lived in Yosemite. So I, I don't know what my life would be like if, if I would have quit that day. Um, it'd be a lot different. It would be a lot, lot different, I imagine. I can't say better or worse. I just don't know. But I will say everything that has come after that experience, there has been just joy after joy after just life-changing joy. So if you are at some sort of crossroad and you feel like you got to quit, uh, you know, and there things are really hard, you know, this sometimes fate has a way of telling you which direction to go, you know, whether to the right or to the left, I think you'll just know which way you're, what you're supposed to do. And there will be some signs, there will be some uh, things that happen that help you decide for me it was some dude biking around the world and some rain yeah anyway that is that is my experience biking through uh the middle of death valley in the middle of the summer <laughs>